Good morning and welcome to our second virtual career chat. I'm delighted to be hosting today a Barclay group with their supply chain. Um, last year, Barclay joined us and have recruited a number of our candidates into assistant site manager roles. So we're delighted to have one of them with us here today and very much looking forward to hearing his journey in due course. So um, sit back and enjoy and over to you, Angela. OK, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to our virtual career chats with myself, Angela Forbes. It is a great pleasure to have you with us this morning. Now, I do hope you all spent Tuesday evening celebrating Burns Night and doing the dashing white sergeants in your front room. I know haggis suppers from chip shops all around Glasgow duly sold out. Now, today is Holocaust Memorial Day. It's a day for everyone to remember the millions of people who were killed or whose lives have been changed by the Holocaust. Now, our own psychologist, Bernie Graham, who featured in the BBC One documentary, My Family, the Holocaust and Me, are re-showing it this week to mark the occasion. And Bernie is also being interviewed tomorrow on talk radio by Rob Rinder at 5 p.m. if anyone wishes to tune in and hear more about managing your mental health and its impact on this anniversary. If you are affected and you would like to talk, then please do get in touch with our team. We're all too willing to have a chat. Now, this morning, we are delighted to be joined by House Builder Berkeley Group. They are a leader in urban regeneration with a target of over 95% of their developments on brownfield land. And their other green credentials are equally outstanding. So a fascinating organisation to, to listen to today. We have five speakers. We'll welcome Sophie Harrison, their Head of Communications. We hear from Pat Duffin, Divisional Production Director. We've got their supply chain with us this morning. So we've got MCG Construction, Brian McBrearty, and DPD um, Carpenters, Neve Tracy. And we're delighted David Wood, Apprentice Site Manager, can join us. And he'll share his own transition from the Armed Forces into Berkeley. They will also discuss their current job opportunities as well. And then we'll jump to the, the Q&A. So please feel free to type in any questions you have as we go. And I'm delighted to pass to Sophie to kick us off and we'll all switch our cameras off. Great. Good morning, everybody. And thank you very much for joining us. Um, so I'm going to keep it super brief. Who are we? Well, you will have heard of Barclay Group and they are our parent company. So we are a division of them and we employ about 450 people directly. To give you a sense of scale, we have around 1,500 jobs across our offices and sites. So that includes all of our subcontractor workforce. So as you can imagine, there are lots of opportunities. Um, we currently have seven life sites. We have three in London, then sites in Staines upon Thames, Fleet in Hampshire, and Reading. We build a whole range of homes from super posh penthouses in zone one of London, right up to a traditional English village, uh, complete with its own country park, school, shops, and, and cafe. That really is just to give you a quick insight into who we are. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about job opportunities at the end, but for now, I will hand back over to you, Angela. Thank you for that, Sophie. And we'll pass to Pat. If you could join us, Pat. Thank you, Angela. And good morning, everyone. So welcome, everybody. And thank you all for joining us. And thank you for taking time out of your days to listen to me and the other people we've got on here. This is the second year that we've done this as Barclay St Ed Edwards, and it's the second year that I've taken part in this as well. So hopefully that shows that it was a success last year and that we are putting time and effort into making this work and that you have a commitment at board level of Barclay St Edwards to, to make this work. That should give you some comfort. If you have any doubts about joining us or having a career in construction, so I'm going to talk to you about a career in construction this morning, and I'm going to talk to you about one career in particular, which will be mine, because that's the one that I know most about. So what I'm trying to demonstrate this morning is that it's, it really is a career for everybody. I was, I was trying to think of an analogy to put towards a career in construction, and the best that I could come up with is probably one of the famous phrases sayings around rugby now rugby is a game for everybody of all shapes and sizes there's 
forwards, there's backs, you've got special people in the front row. I'm sure we all know a few of those people. Construction is very much like that. We've got jobs, roles, opportunity for a multitude of people from a multitude of backgrounds with a multitude of skill sets. But I'm just going to take you through three of them later, the three main ones, the build, the construction and the technical. So to take you through my journey into construction, it, it wasn't something that I was set out to do. It was something that my family did, my father did, and I grew to love it from a very early age. And I've, I've had a brilliant career in construction, which I'll take you through now. So just at the top left of the slide, this is how I started my career in construction, which was very hard work indeed. So I used to work long hours, and do very physical labor laying concrete wheelbarrowing concrete up ramps doing block laying doing ground works digging holes putting drainage in fetching things for people so moving on to the next picture on the right and I'm, not, I'm sure you'll be aware of people operating this kind of equipment you'll see them on the roads you'll see them on sites so the theodolite and the dumpy level now one day when i was working in glasgow it was particularly cold. It was about minus two. I think it was August. It was raining, of course. Um, the site engineer, his chain person, didn't appear to work that day. So the chain person is the person you can see on the right-hand side of that picture, kneeling down in really awkward position for that gentleman on the theodolite to tell them what to do. So I volunteered for that role, and I liked it because I didn't get that much of a bad back or calluses on my hand, I was able to moisturize and keep my hands supple. So I wanted to be on the other end of that, telling people what to do. So I, I got on well with the engineer and he taught me how to set out. He gave me opportunities to get on the dumpy level, get on the theodolite, and to come away from the physical labor and more into the, the thinking element, which I really enjoyed, got very capable on the instruments and I got offered an opportunity to go to university to study. That was with a company called Molan, who were a very good contractor who unfortunately are no longer around. They got bought out by Carillion. And as we all know, Carillion no longer exists through different reasons. No fault of mine, I might add. So I went to university and did a four year sandwich course. Now, I remember on that course, there were probably about 40 people starting the course. There were six of us who were not quite middle aged, but older people. I went to the student. And then there were several people there who were fresh out of university or colleges. They lasted one semester. The second semester of my course was basically six people, six people who had a background from work and a background from construction. All, all six of us graduated, all six of us are st t still in touch, and all six of us have very successful careers in construction. So I graduated with a uh, construction degree, and then I went back to working in the industry, and I went back onto site as, a, as an engineer. Now, there, there is a traditional route through the construction route, which, which I took, which is basically starting on site as an engineer, which is one of the lowest positions on site. You work up through assistant site manager. I think it was a sub agent in those days, then a site manager or a site agent as it was for me. And the roles change quite, well, it's quite a dramatic change really in the role. So you are, when you are setting out on site, you are, you are effectively putting the buildings together and building the buildings with the subcontractors. Contrary to popular opinion, subcontractors are your friends, not your enemies. If you can't get on with your subcontractors and work together, you've got no chance of successfully completing your project. So you go from setting out the buildings to becoming more office based or so your site manager, which is the bottom right picture. So you're more about looking at the drawings, organizing materials, organizing labor, deciding when you need people, which areas you want to work in and when and making sure that you've got the right design information and the right contractors in place at the right time to do your job. You're also looking after quality issues, you're looking after health and safety issues, and you're looking after the welfare of yourself and of other people on the projects. 
when you work your way up through the site management role, which is a lot of time is spent on site, you come to that bottom center picture. Now I've depicted a project manager here as this guy on the left hand side who is doing this with his hand saying, yep, yeah, that crane is about five mil out of level. So you get to a lofty position and a lot of people, it goes to the heads, they start taking nonsense, start talking nonsense, but we need to keep our feet on the ground at that point and remember our background and where we've come from and again engage with people and work with people. At project manager level, you are effectively responsible for the delivery of the job. So you will have a number of people reporting to you. And this is where your management skills and your people management skills refocus. So you, you need to understand people's needs, people's wants, people's desires. We have a lot of subcontractors working for us. And the, the reason that they come to work, a lot of them are varied. Come, some come because they, they want to, some come because they have to, some come because they love the job, or some come because they are, is it sadists or masochists, one or the other, anyway. We are all in that position, ultimately working in construction. You, you become effective and good at the project management level, and then you come on to this level at the left, which is a project director level or a board director level, which is where you spend most of your time in meetings. So I like to think I'm that guy stood up in the blue shirt at the end talking to people, and I can't see you all, but I'm sure you're not all asleep, but I do generally tend to put most people to sleep during my meetings. But here, you, the, the higher up you go in the organization, and it's probably true of most organizations, the less effective you become or the less effective you feel you become, which again relies a lot on relying on other people and how you treat and interact with other people and the relationships with other people. You want all to do things how you want them, when you want them and where you want them. So, so I suppose what I'm trying to say is that a lot of construction isn't just about construction, it's a lot of people management as well. You You need to you need to have good people skills to succeed. So the, I said, it, oh, sorry. So the build and the technical and commercial. So there are three distinct groups, and they they have quite different skill sets, but they also have quite similar skill sets. And I'll, I'll take you through those in a bit. So back to me. So where in the world? I've, I've put this in because I, I'm very fortunate to have worked different places in the world. I'm sure a lot of you guys have been to different places in the world as well. And if you enjoy that part of what you're doing now or what you were doing, then there, there are opportunities in construction to work in different areas of the country. So the top left, I've worked in Liverpool. The centre is Manchester and the right hand side is London. I've also worked in Leeds and Glasgow and in Blackpool and other areas within the UK as well. So, so there are many opportunities in many different places of the country if you want. Coming down the right hand side, the bottom right is a project that I worked on in Q8. Coming across to the left, that's a project in Alain, which is in the, the UAE. The bottom left is a project I worked on in India. And that centre left is a project that I worked on in Dubai and I also worked in Abu Dhabi. I've, I've worked in a lot of the Emirates within the UAE. I've done jobs in India. I've overseen jobs in Singapore and Indonesia and Malaysia as well. So it's there are the opportunities out there for people who want them. And if you want to make a go of it, the opportunities are everywhere. They're, they're worldwide. The only thing holding you back in construction will be yourselves and your ambition, quite frankly. So technical. What is technical? This is the probably the most organized part of the, the production team. The production team is the build of the technical and the commercial. So the technical organizes all the information that we need on the projects in order to build the projects. And in order for us to go in and find the information, it needs to be well ordered, well defined and well organized. All of that falls under the, the remit of the technical department. They generally have document controllers to work in document management systems so that we're easy, able to find whatever we need, whatever we're looking for. 
there's all kinds of things stored in the document management system. We have drawings, we have specifications, we have commercial reports, we have instructions, we have contracts. That is our database for the site. You should be able to enter the document management system and find whatever you require relating to that project and you should be able to find it quite easily. All of that comes under the technical remit. So the more familiar role for you guys with the technical remit will be what I'm showing on screen now, which is actually putting the buildings together. So this is quite a basic structural model that we've got. This is one of our jobs that we've, we're taking through planning at the moment. It's over at Scion Lane. So that this is quite a complicated structural building. So the concrete frame over the Tesco apartment has lots of very tricky details, transfer slabs. So that there is a lot of con concrete and a lot of loading to come down the building, which needs to be distributed across the frame and down through the through the building into piles and through the ground. So all this is a, a technical solution. In, in order to work out what goes in the ground, you first need to work out what goes on top of it. We don't do this ourselves. We employ consultant structural engineers to do this work. And the structural engineers, the architects, the MEP engineers, all of those consultancies and in particular fire engineers nowadays, that they call all fall under the technical department it is their remit to manage these people. The technical department also look after the facades. I'm sure you're all aware that facades is a big thing in the news at the minute and has been for a number of years, unfortunately, with, the, with what happened at Grenfell. So facades are, are a big thing. And, and we, as Barclays St Edwards, we stopped putting any combustible material in our, our facades over two years ago. So we were probably a little bit ahead of, of the market. But facades are extremely compli complicated and they do take a lot of time to understand and to get right. There are a lot of rules and regulations around facades, some of which can be conflicting. So it does take a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of technical ability in order to start onto your structural frame. And a lot of the time you, you need to be advanced in your facade in order to get your structural frame to work as the two work in conjunction with each other. Sorry, I've just shown you slides of the big elements of the job or two of the big elements of the job, which are the technical remit. The, the other part of the technical remit are the small details as well. So all the big elements people look at, but don't really look at, they don't get close to. Whereas the finer detailing is how things, how things look right in buildings and how things in buildings. So, so this is a chandelier that's it. This is one of our business and leisure suites. So one of the problems that we have or had and do have is how we can get that chandelier to hang in a plasterboard ceiling. So a plasterboard ceiling, as I'm sure you're all aware, will not take much weight. You, you probably have plasterboard at home. You'll put a screw in. It'll go through. You'll hang the picture on maybe three or four weeks later, the picture's sunk because there is no structural stability in that plasterboard wall. So we have to design things above the plasterboard, fixed back to concrete or steel in order to take the weight of these things. So the thing that's going on behind the scenes technically that people don't see, and as you walk into that building, you'll just see a beautiful white shade or you'll see a nice skirting detail or you'll see a door or a window reveal, a window board, a floor junction, how tiles meet shower screens, how a sink, floats on that wall that you just see tiled or your wall hung toilet. There's a multitude of things going on behind everything, all the bits and pieces that you see. And in order to make them look good and look how we want them to look, there's an awful lot goes on behind that tile, that paint, that door. And that's what the technical department do. So that's the nuts and bolts of the technical department. The, the peripheries that they've got to work alongside are a lot of the statutory bodies. So a lot of the utilities, so the electricity companies, the gas companies, 
the water that comes into the building, the sewage that goes out of the building, the surface water that goes out of the building. The technical department also have to liaise with building control, who I'm sure with the Grenfell, they've been in the news quite often as well. London Fire Brigade, but obviously it depends where in the country you're building, but the local fire brigade as well. And the police, the, the police get involved with Secure by Design, so we need to make sure that our homes are very difficult to be broken into. We also have to work with the planning department to make sure that what we build matches what we've got planning for. We can get into serious trouble if we don't build what we've got planning for. They can obviously make you take down what you've built. Briam, which is a sustainability requirement, if it's possible and are designed as efficiently as possible, we'll come back to the post office bit. Warranty providers, so the likes of the NHBC, Premier, LABC, the people who buy insurance for our customers when we build our homes. The technical departments are involved with those companies as well because they like things a certain way. They might have experiences on other projects, so they want to incorporate details or product specifications on our product on our projects. And it's a technical who liaise with those guys. The clients of the commercial, the residentials, and the RSLs. So we not only do we sell to customers who occupy the homes, live in the homes, buy the homes, but we'll work with the likes of Peabody or Dolphin Living as well. And they they have their own specifications. They have their their own ways of how they want their apartments to look. So the technical teams deal with those people as well. Highways, so the roads, transport for London the railways, London undergrounds, especially when you're working in London, you're always dealing with these authorities. There's there's always something over your head, there's something beside you, or there's something below the ground, and you need to liaise with those people. The post office is because sometimes the technical team are referred to as the post office. They get all of the information in, they have to sort it and organise it, and then send it out in a way that the rest of the team, the build and the commercial, can understand. They're like a filter system. So construction, which is the route that I came up. Big toys. Everyone always likes to play with big toys. So we've got a lot of excavators there, piling rigs. So this is a basement going in on our stains job, which is in London. So it can be very mucky, it can be very dirty, but it is ultimately very, very rewarding. So what is the site manager role? So a site manager role is about organizing the way that I used to organise was to just have a list and tick off the things that you did that day and add to the bottom of the list the things that grew that, that went on it that day. Sometimes you get disheartened because you tick two things off and you get 22 things added, but you keep going and you do what you can and you get there in the end. We also meet with contractors subcontractors we meet with our own people as well talk through rooms and, and again it's about the relationships with people we're obviously very mindful of time because we have to get things finished on time we all have deadlines and those deadlines can't be missed and we all have budgets to work to as well so that there are things we'd all like to do <clears throat> excuse me but we can't always afford to do so as a site manager you need to have an eye on the day-to-day -day things in order to get to your end date. You need to work with people because you need those people in order to carry out the tasks to get to your end date. And you obviously need to do it within the budget that you've been allocated to do it. It's not all boring. This is Holly, one of our site managers. So this is a gotcha rescue training day. So Holly's up a tower crane and you get into a, a harness and you jump off the tower. Jump off's probably a bit dramatic, but you walk off the tower crane and you let yourself down. So th th this is part and parcel of site manager is it's not just about the day to day that there are things that you can do or that come at you that you, you wouldn't be aware of. So although you may think lists are mundane, there are the interesting things in there as well. And every day is different. So this is one of our projects at Kensington. This is to try and demonstrate to you how congested our projects are and how important to us logistics are. Logistics to the backbone, fundamentally, of our jobs. If, if we can't get 
people and products to the places we need them. Their jobs are choked. I'm sure you guys are all, are all over your logistics and we need to be as well. So our logistics are planned from very early doors. And you'll be hearing from Brian later, who's McGinley's. And we, we, try, we try and engage people like that early on so we get the value of their experience and we try and integrate it. And it does affect the way that we build buildings. It affects the way we occupy buildings. It affects where we put things and ultimately affects our program and our costs. Obviously, the quicker we do stuff, the less money we, we pay. So part of the construction is is walking out on sites. I, I'm a big believer of boots on and, and walking the job. I still do it now. I, it's one of the things that I love doing, getting out on site, talking to people, looking at things, solving problems on the sites. And there is a lot of problem solving on sites. If you are problem solving, construction is the place for you. And in particular, the building side of construction is the place for you because there, there are many problems to overcome on a daily basis. There are the more structured meetings. We sit down and we talk about problems we have on site. We generally get drawings out. We try not to get contracts out. If you get contracts out, you're in a very dark place and you don't want to be there. So, so we sit around, we try and make the people as comfortable as possible that we're talking to, and then we, we get to a solution. My own aim is to get to a solution. And then if there are any other issues that fall out of the back of it, commercial issues or technical issues, we solve those afterwards. So we don't get bogged down in the detail. We'll get to the solution. And then we'll work out how we how we control it contractually and financially with with the subcontractor at that point. Commercial. So the commercial people in the business, they hold the purse strings to the job. So they work again at an early stage through the planning stage and they put our budgets together. So we need to understand what it is we are building from an early stage, the height the size, the floor area, what the facade is going to be, what flooring we're going to have, what doors we're going to have, what paint, are we having air conditioning, are we having underfloor heating, are we having air source heat pumps, are we having chillers, are we having boilers, so there's a lot of different elements. So the cost plan goes together based on the product that we want to deliver, which is stage one. Stage two is the procurement. Now, in between stage one and stage two, the technical team do their thing. They design the building, but they need to design the building to what the budget is based on. And out of the technical team come the drawing information, the specification information that procurement allows, or that allows procurement, sorry. So we get the documents and we send them out to a number of subcontractors. We then get the prices back from subcontractors. Now we send it out in a certain format and ask for it back in a certain format. And as I'm sure Neve might tell you in a, a, a later, I'm sure she will be aware of it. We always get it back in the format that we send it out in. So we have to work through everybody's tender returns and try to align them best so that we make sure that we get best value on site. Now, best value at Barclay St. Edwards does not mean cheapest. Definitely doesn't mean cheapest. I've been in places where it does mean cheapest and you end up with headaches. So best value to us means that they are cost effective, yes, but not necessarily the cheapest. They have good health and safety. They have good quality and they have good relationships with us. The relationships is everything. I like to know that if there is a problem on the job, I can pick up the phone to somebody in that company and the problem will get resolved. Everything else will get resolved in future. But I know that I've got somebody that I can call upon to help me out when I'm in a sticky situation. And the same goes for subcontractor. If that subcontractor is in a sticky situation and they do get in situations, they call me up and they can get my help, which I have done on a number of occasions to subcontractors. It's, it is a two way street. Stage three is managing the contractors. So the procurement's done, the contractors are appointed, they are on site and we manage them on site. So those are the three basic stages of what the official team do. So in the budgets, so I've already gone through that. Sorry, I forgot this slide was coming up. So quantities are measured in different ways, linear meters, square meters, square foot, 
cubic meters if it's concrete and what the commercial team does is they do what's called a takeoff so they understand the quantities that go into each building so there might be 4,000 cubic meters of concrete 2,000 square meters of facade 5,000 square meters of flooring in the building 3,000 linear meters of skirting 500 doors so it's those kind of quantities that we get to and that used to be by sitting with the drawings in front of you and having a ruler and working out what they are there is software available to do that now but what we like to do is use the user software and then go back to the old methods just to double check the specification element is what i mentioned before so for a door we'll want to know what timber it is what veneer it is what fire rating it is, whether it's got a smoke seal on it, what door handle it has, what the hinges are, whether it's got a closer, what the door frame is that it's going into and what the architrave is. So it can be, the specification is very in-depth and there are certain performance criteria such as fire, such as sound, that the elements need to meet. The rates we get are just the cost. So how much does it cost? And different contractors break down their rates in different ways. The, the rate buildup is effectively how much the material costs, how much the labour costs to put it where it needs to go under markup. So their overhead and profit. So procurement. So the commercial team get the documents from the commercial team. Sorry, not the commercial team, from the technical team. And they put all those documents together in the way that's sent out in an easy to understand way. To the contractor which they would come back so during the tender process we invite the, co the contractors in to talk through the job to make sure they've understood it and this is where prices can fluctuate quite a lot as they first come in different people interpret the information in a different way so your prices can be quite varied once we bring everybody in and talk them through the job and get the questions and the answers which we then give to everybody then the prices become more aligned it's at that point you basically form a committee on the project which is the project director the commercial director the technical director and the construction director and we talk through the pros and the cons of the different contractors and it's usually taken down then from what was probably six to two or three and then you continue with the two or three until you get to your your preferred contractor managing contracts now invariably the way we work we like to get planning get the design and get onto site quickly we have what are called scope gaps. We don't capture everything at the first attempt. We'd love to, but we don't. Unfortunately, it's the nature of these. We would expect someone to price something be in a package, but because we're moving at speed, we don't always capture it. So we ask a contractor for a price. We get the price back. We don't like it. We ask them for another. We like it a little less, or sorry, a little more. We don't like it, but we like it a little more. So we issue a variation, which is a variation to the contract, and then they get on with their work. That, that is a big part of what we do, contract management. So the commercial team also look after the monthly payments. So we pay on a monthly basis. So every month that somebody does the work, their QS comes out and measures it, puts in an application, our QS measures it. Hopefully they meet together to agree and just and we also go through the final account process. So that's basically just a totting up with a bill at the end of the job. Some are easy, some are more challenging, but the majority of them are easy. So there is also a lot of reporting commercially. We like to understand where we are commercially, whether we're going over budget, whether we're going under budget, if we need to move money from one budget to another budget, if there is somewhere that we're leaking money that we need to concentrate on. So it, it really does highlight where the job we we need to focus on at that particular point in the time the commercial team also control the tr contractual side so they understand contract law or they should understand contract law more than the other the technical or the or the build department not to say they don't understand but commercial department generally have a greater knowledge of that so i hope that gives you an idea and an overview of what you could be coming into and i hope it gives you an overview of what Barclay St Edwards expect from you when it comes in. And I hope it gives you something understanding that myself, I, I will into the company 
and the company as a whole do and we are putting a lot of effort and time and energy into trying to make you feel welcome and to entice you in so i'll take questions later but over to angela for now Pat, that was very detailed. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. If I could ask your colleague Brian from McGinley's to join us. I think Patrick's yes. just unsharing his screen. He can get off the screen so he can now. He's had his bit. <laughs> there you go. Now, I don't know how I'm going to follow up on, on what Pat has presented there. He's gone into quite a bit of a good detail. But I know Pat now nearly 16 years, so I'm not surprised at the level of detail that he's gone into. But I'm going to share a bit of my presentation with you now. Can I share the screen? Yep, absolutely. I'm just trying to figure out how you do this. Let me just share the screen now. Here, here. One second. I'm just going to share it here now. Not, that's it. Not that. Perfect. Not that part. This one here, yeah? Yep, that's it. Right then, so I'm just going to press play here. Um, right then, so my name is Brian McBurdy. I'm Ops Director with MCG Construction. So I'm, and I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview of what we do as a good business. So we sit under the umbrella of MCG Group, which has multi sectors in regards. We work in construction, healthcare, education, we have tech, and we're located now after making some acquisitions both in the UK, um, America and the South East of like them, Saudi and the Arab Emirates. So we are group of turnovers about 176 million per annum. And we're and I've been with the company now for 17 years. So it's a family owned business, so it is. And um, yeah, I take great pride and good good joy to say I've been with the business for that period of time. Um, the UK, which is probably your biggest interest to the captive audience here, that's our offices that, that cover the UK. And I've also said about we are also we've also got a got two offices in South Africa that do our um, admin side of things and our compliance side of things. There's probably about thirty people out there, so there is. Um, these are some of our accreditations. I'm sure you're all fairly familiar with the likes of CHAS, um, SIAs for security, SMAS. So I'm sure they're construction on line. And our recruitment specialisms. So on any given day in the construction division, we have about 3,000 plus operatives out. And that's across uh, the whole of the United Kingdom. Majority of them are true, true are trades of people, but we also have a big uh, logistics division, which I oversee. And uh, currently we've got 25 projects. So we have, these are some of the companies that we are, that we are the currently supplying tr trades to get technical people and also our logistics services. Like I say, um, I've got to know Pat probably over this last 15 years when I started to supply to the Berkeley Group as a business. And as Pat alluded to himself, it's all about the relationships. You know, Pat has called me on many occasions. I've also returned his calls when I've tried to get hold of him, where we strike up a good, strong, it's actually a friendship, to be honest. And that's what we do when we work as a business. And yeah, it's quite, um, it's a good, good partnership. What, is. what we do with regard to the logistics is we control and um, yeah, manage all the site access for both traffic and pedestrians, which is a key good part of the construction project of all our jobs. And as the Pat said also, we get involved a pre-con stage, so we do, where we develop the traffic management plans, the pedestrian access, access, and also we preempt all the deliveries that actually come to the projects. We actually have technology that track all our deliveries from the origin 
to the destination. So all our tracking is done just in time. So because all these, a lot of the projects were on, as you've seen from a couple of pictures after the job in Kensington are tied for space. So it isn't a case where we get a load of deliveries to a job and just hope that they go into the building. They all have to be key delivery and get timed in such a way that they get onto the job, into the job, and the builders get on with it then. So I think that's why there's a big correlation between arm, army, ex army personnel because they're strong on the logistics side with regards to organizing their day to day diaries, what they have to do if they're going away on secondment. So it's quite a lot of collaboration there between the two. And we actually have a couple of ex-army personnel who are logistics and managers for us. And I also remember a guy that came straight out of the army, hadn't been in construction before, but he got trained up as a crane supervisor before he, uh, before he finished with the army. And he's actually gone on and he progressed his own career with the help of us at MCG to um, become an AP. And now he's actually in the far east this last four or five years. So he is. And it just goes to show that there's life outside of the army because, and I do understand that the army spend a lot of time training people up. So they do, especially as I've met ex army personnel who specialize in health and safety, which seems to be a big trait that you spring out of the army which is a very, very useful skill to have whenever you do come out of the army and go into the likes of construction. And basically, I'm here just to offer you the opportunity. If you need to um, come and spend a day or two in one of our good jobs, or you want to sign up to our good company and get the notifications of any positions that we have across any of our clients, it's just not the birthday group group group. It's just the other companies there that have listed, but we deal with hundreds of companies throughout the UK, and there is always opportunities to come in, either if it's health and safety, site management, on the commercial side of things, or the pre-con. You know, we're very open to getting people onto the books and into one of our clients good jobs. We also um, ensure once we have people into our company, like, you know, we're always up skilling our people like though I've got lots of people who are on the team who have started off from a general op operative position and they've gone through the step-by-step -step process of being like a general operative, a ganger man, supervisor, you know, step-by-step-by-step. By step by step. We've given them that career path and that's what we tend to do and a lot of the managers we currently have have been on a good journey with the MCG the whole way through their career, you know, and it's all about Again, it's building a relationship, it's building the trust with each other, it's collaborating and just it works out to get better for everyone in, in the fall because we know we've got people on the, we've got our, if you want to say our foot soldiers on the group around, on our projects who actually care and that can only be of benefit to our clients who, we, with, with logistics especially, we work in a partnership with our clients, so we do. We don't see us as being another subcontractor under them. We actually work in a partnership with them, like, and we do a lot of the collaboration on the jobs. Like I said, from the from the traffic ma management, pedestrian yeah, management, we actually coordinate the daily coordination meetings, or we hold the daily coordination meetings each afternoon, and we take the lead in them where all the subcontractors and managers will show up. And we basically, we tactically plan out what we're going to be doing the next day, the day after, and the day after that. So it isn't a case when we're on a job, we come in on the, the morning and we go, right, and go, go, what are we going to do here, guys? You know, we're always organized, we're always prepared. What I'm sure is a trait with a lot of ex-army personnel will have in their DNA from the training that they would have had. Um, we've linked up with a lot of the partnerships, so we do. We've, um, and this is why I'm so keen to get involved with the build force. As you can see from the slide here, we offer apprenticeships, and we currently have the ten apprentices out at the moment. 
Um, I've got a couple on of some of the past projects and they've proved very successful. Like, you know, we need to attract the young people into the construction industry. We need to try to attract ex-army personnel. We're even attracting ex-prisoners, uh, like, you know, getting them to go back on the path to get back into recovery, get back on the straight and narrow, and everyone such as ex-offenders um, deserve a good chance, like, you know. Um, we see that's sort of a corporate responsibility, so that's just a slide, just reiterating what we do. Also, if there's anybody who hasn't got a CV coming out of the army, we hold um, days up in our head office or in any of our offices that will actually uh, give you an opportunity to put your CV together. We'll also then help you stand it out to the various clients that we have. And this is something we do as, as a free of charge. We don't believe in, like, you know, we're just trying to get people to get back into the industry because I love the construction industry. I'm not as really well traveled as a path, but I've worked in construction in Australia, America, and here in the United Kingdom, as well as obviously back home in Ireland. So, and I love it, love construction, love the people, and it's all about building the friendships and the relationships. So it is. And I'm just all about making a change in the industry. That's about us. That's about all I have to say. It isn't necessarily a detail that's good, Pat's, but I'll share all the details. Like this is something that we have as our values, which I think is very important. Also, I'm sure you have the same values after being in the army. You know, being good, genuine, attentive, respectful, tenacious, and ethical. These are something that we drive through all of our employees, all the people we put onto our jobs, and it's how we operate as a good business and as a group. So it is. And if anyone wants to get in touch with you, I'll share this on LinkedIn. I'll give Sophie the details, but please drop me an email, give me a call, and we can take you on the next step of your career when you come out of the army. And right, that, that, was it. that is that is all excellent. I have to say. Sorry for the shortness of it, but. No, I wouldn't change a single bit of it. That was very, very good. Thank you. A few questions that I've got, which I'll ask at the end. If we could pass to your colleague, uh, Neve. Green. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am first. Uh, my name is Neve Tracy. I am a director of a carpentry and joinery company. We are a different kettle of fish to Berkeley's and McGinley's. They're quite significantly bigger than we are. We're a family owned and run uh, subcontractor, so we're a specialist trade. Um, I come from a quantity surveying background. I was lucky enough to go to university straight out of school, not trades background myself. But um, I have managed to pick it up the last five years. I still don't think I could hang a door, but I'm quite comfortable telling someone else how to do it. So I'm going to share my screen now. That's it, Neve. Um, Thank you. OK, so this uh, DPT, who we are, um, DPT stands for Dennis Paul Tracy. So Dennis is actually my dad. He started, he was in Ireland over 30 years ago, carpenter by trade, um, set up a carpentry and joinery company for someone else, was the director of that for a few, about 10 years or so. Uh, then in 2005, he went out on his own and started DPT in my uh, bedroom. I had like a bunk bed and there was a desk underneath it. So that's where we started. Um, 15 years later, we, moved to where we are now, which is Langley, which is these two buildings. So the top floor is offices and underneath we have a manufacturing warehouse. So we are predominantly the first 15 years, we are site installed, similar to what kind of Patrick, he mentioned architects and doors, um, carpenters on site. And now we're developing as a business to eventually become 100% self-sufficient. So we're manufacturing all of our products, like we're running skirting, we're making fire doors, making all of our joinery in-house. This, um, opportunities-wise, this means that we have a team teams on site and we have teams of tradesmen in the office, well, underneath the office as well in the workshop. Um, the type of projects that we do, we do everything. Carpentry and joinery, I think, is one of the most um, diverse trades. We do lots of different types of projects from high rise flats, um, similar to what Berkeley Homes traditionally do. Schools, hospitals, high end residential for all of the 
wealthy people in central London where they have one house and it could probably home about 150 people. Um, bespoke joinery, historical refurbishment. So they're always the interesting ones. We always have one of them uh, ticking along and they're the ones that are the most challenging. But we do everything. So anything that's timber from a roof right up to the high end joinery, we will turn our hand to. For our more um, our closer clients, the clients we work for all the time, we will turn our hand and take risks with um, doing stuff like glass, bronze, you know, different materials um, for, for sometimes when they can't get someone else to do it. I personally believe, and it's from experience as well, uh, carpentry tradesmen can turn his hand to anything. I have seen some of our better lads turn their hands to electrics, plumbing, just glass, bronze, everything, welding, every, anything, anything that takes, you know, a little bit about you to be able to do it. I, I think a good carpenter can do it. Being from the army yourselves, obviously, you're, you're probably just like that by nature. You, you kind of have the attitude of, yeah, I'll give it a go. So um, a skill like carpentry behind you would would be a quite good stepping stone for the industry itself if you want to stay on the trade side. Uh, type of work we do, first fix. These are pictures of from live jobs because it, I think it's easier to kind of have an idea of what we actually do by looking at it as it's in progress. Stuff like uh, roofing, joist work, capping around lift shafts. Um, there, the middle picture there is um, decking. So it's the um, framework for some decks. We've got some pedestals there that will help level it out. This is probably, these are probably from a Berkeley's job. This is some boxing out around piping. None of this is particularly highly skilled. You know, this is someone that's quite good with their hands, quite, um, e you know, quite good at working fast, could do like lots of these in, in a day. Um, then we do stuff like second fix. So, you know, you've got the picture on the left here is a job in East India Dock, which is a office block and that's all cladding that we did on the outside. The middle picture is a travel lodge in East London as well, it's just skirting and doors. The picture on the right is some uh, fire doors in the Hospital St John and Elizabeth. And the picture below is a bedhead for Great Ormond Street's um, parents, it's Poet's Place, so it's where their parents stay when their kids are sick. So, you know, from one extreme, we've got an office, external works on an office building, right down to, a bedhead for um, you know parents to stay in when their child is sick. So we, we do get involved in lots and lots of different types of projects. Just more examples of second fix work. There's a windowsill and some kitchens. Uh, joinery, uh, there are two different types of carpenters in the world. Well, there's three now, actually. Um, there's fixers who are people that generally will kind of do like the first fix work and you know, their, their work will be quite basic, but sometimes they come from shuttering backgrounds, concrete. Um, then there's carpenters who will do doors and, you know, kind of basic second fix on site. And then, then you have joiners. So joiners is a skill that's obviously developed over a long time, originates from, you start doing carpentry and stuff. A joiner can typically do anything. Um, the top left-hand picture is a bathroom pod. We did um, in Great Ormond Street as well. It was um, putting bathrooms into the rooms so that the parents don't have to leave. That's all curved MDF. So that was quite bespoke in each room that we did. The middle picture is um, we did all of the IPS units underneath the sink. We fit the mirrors. I think we actually did fit the sinks because they were commissioned by someone else. That's in a Boeing hangar at Gatwick Airport. So it's the offices for Boeing. Picture on the right is some bespoke radiator casings for in. Pembroke, which is like Pembroke Gardens is Holland Park, a uh, private family home. They ended up gilding all of that, all of the joining that turned out really nice. And the bottom picture is all reclaimed wood that we used for like a seating area for a cafe that was underneath a block of residential flats. So very, very different work across very, very different projects, um, which all require different sets of skills from, from each of our team members. Um, something that if you are looking, something that's quite prominent in the industry at the moment is fire doors, uh, particularly since Grenfell. 
the information has always been there, but the onus now placed on companies like ourselves and our and our installers has like significantly the pressure is, is on 24-7 to make sure it's 100 percent right, 100 percent competent, 100 percent certified. So um, the picture that you see is actually snapped from a video that I normally get our operatives to watch, like especially people that are new to the business, um, installers and joiners that are new to the business. Those videos, some of you may have seen a burn test before. Um, if you haven't seen one, sometimes I'm a bit of a door nerd, so, um, but my opinion is they are actually quite interesting to watch. Um, if a door is ever designed, the handle, the hinges, every single element of the door needs to be tested and burned you know, physically put into a furnace and burnt to test that it lasts how long it's supposed to last. These are interesting because you might learn a trade, so you might learn how to fit a door and you might learn how to do everything, but if you don't understand the tolerances behind it, you know, th this is what happens essentially. So those three doors in the video look like they're installed correctly, a fire is lit behind them, and as you can see, the door on the far right has already failed at two minutes. Now, that door to any normal person, even, you know, as the chippy was installing it, he might fit everything correctly, bar one item. Um, the reason I'm talking about this is because if there is, it's, it's, it's obviously a lot nicher than the likes of, you know, going into the bigger construction companies, but there is an opportunity or more, lots of opportunities out there in the industry to become part of this fire door or fire auditing, um, inspections, um, even like become part of writing literature and stuff for fire doors. There's lots of training out there available. The company BM Trada up in the top right, the logo there, we are certified to install and maintain doors. We've been with them for six years now. Um, so that means there's, we trace all of our compliance on site. It means that our if our clients pay for it, because there's a lot of paperwork, they get a handover of who installed which door, what date they install them. They get a plug or a label that makes them traceable, um, which is a lot of work. So a company like us, we generally need to take people on to do all of that paperwork. It's interesting if you're interested in it. If you're not interested in it, it's probably not interesting, but it is an industry that is growing massively. Um, if you're meticulous and you like things to be done right, it is a very, it's probably quite good place to look at companies like BM Trada are recruiting and training all the time like they don't have enough people to do what they're supposed to do we get audited four or five times a year and he's always stretched for time and stuff of that it's not a particularly challenging job it's a job that you can do really well and it's a job that you can care about so that's obviously not something we can do but I do think that if it's something that I could raise your attention that if you think you might be interested in um it is something that that's a growing industry and there's lots and lots of opportunities within. Um, that's just more pictures of our install of fire doors. Um, the, the next people I want to talk about is, um, so we are carpentry and joining, our fixers predominantly are the bread and butter of our business. You can make really good money if you're a good chippy. You know, we've got chippies on £350 a day, um, price work, fitting doors and skirting, doing lots of repetitive work. Um, but obviously it's a hard slog. I, I don't know, some of you might have backgrounds where you, you, you know, you're, you might not be as physically fit as you were before, or you might not be able to work a whole nine hour day without stopping. Um, so I've got three case studies here that are examples similar to kind of Patrick said, um, the construction industry is just, you can do anything within the industry. Um, I believe that the carpentry trade gives you like that extra edge. I'm biased, obviously, but I do believe having a trade like carpentry behind you gives you, it's a speciality that not everybody can understand and not everybody can do. So an example is Hayden. So Hayden joined us when he started working with Dennis over 20 years ago as a labourer. Um, he came out of college, I think he worked in shops and stuff like that. Um, he came from a slightly disadvantaged background. He started as a labourer, showed a bit of interest, um, was kind of trained up from the broom as a carpenter. Then he started getting problems with his vision 
and he he wasn't able to stay on the tools basically. Um, Hayden is now running one of our most prestigious projects. I can't tell you what project it is, but it's a big house in Westminster um, that belongs to someone very important. And he's been there for two years now and he'll probably be there for another six or seven years. Um, and it's because he understands the trade. He understands his special skill sets or he understands the trade. To do it himself, he would not be, you know, he wouldn't make much money. But he understands how to manage. He's organized. He can, you know, he gets the concept of quality. He can like deal with diff different types of people, particularly in the building that he's in at the moment. There's lots of politics. There's lots of um, different types of people that you have to approach differently. A um, project like that would actually be perfect for yourselves because it would be probably not too much, nothing much new to yourselves the way you have to deal with people like that. Um, but it's just an example of that you can make loads of money and you can learn the trade, but those tra those skills that you get from our trade are can be quite uh, transferable to quite really good um, opportunities. Next one is um, Jared. This is just simple, a nice case study. He did his apprenticeship with us. Um, he has he's now a black hat. He's running you know, one or two of our jobs, not huge jobs yet, because he's still got a lot to learn. But uh, Jared wasn't the fastest chippy in the world. He was he wasn't going to make three hundred pound a day um, on the on the tools. So he transferred his physical skills into management skills. He's not a high flying manager that you know, he, he, he doesn't strike you as that. But his the skills that he does have are applicable to a lot of different types of jobs we do. So we put him on the jobs with the site teams so that we know he can, his skill sets are going to be, you know, good for. Next one is George. Uh, George looks like he's 15, but he's not. He's actually 23, 24. George did a carpentry apprenticeship. I think he did level three. He picked up the phone then one day and he rang and he said, look, I finished my apprenticeship. Um, I'm not a very good chippy, but I love drawings. I like the trade and I want to stay in the trade and I want to learn to be a QS. George has been with us for two years now and he is running. He's, 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 he's doing a very good job. He's nearly running jobs on his own. Um, he's now decided that he wants to do a um, bachelor's degree. So we're going to put him through his degree on his. It's not even day release. He's doing it all in his own time. So it's a four year course. And then by the end of it, he'll have a BSc. But while he's working, while he's gaining knowledge um, in the industry, he came from a background. His dad is a lorry driver. His mom works for the NHS um, as admin. And he didn't really know what he wanted to do. And he was like, oh, I should really get a degree. And I kind of my advice to him because we're a small family run business, you know, where I'm involved in everything that we do. I kind of said, well, it's entirely up to you. It won't affect your progress here because you're either doing a good job or you're not. Um, but I think in the end, he wanted to take the opportunity. So he's going to he'll be with us now, thankfully, for another good couple of years while he's doing that. And um, when he finishes, he won't be coming out of university to do something. He'll have learned. He'll know exactly what he's doing by the time he graduates might help him finish his degree a bit easier. I don't know. Um, I don't think my my degree taught me the life lessons that you need to survive in construction. But um, yeah, so that's an example of who, who I hope that explains who we are, uh, what we do, the different opportunities that there are in construction. Obviously, we have an office as well. We have admin, we have, you know, HR issues, we have marketing, we have accounts, um, you know, buying all of those different departments that, that that are actually still construction related, but have completely transferable skills. So if you're not good on the tools and you want to try something else, then um, there, there's opportunities there for everybody. So um, if I can help with anything, um, please do ask. Um, we're smaller as well. So if you know I can physically help you, I will be the one helping you. Um, we're always open to take on people with the right attitude. So if you want an opportunity and you want to work, that's 95% of the battle. Um, okay, I think that's it. Neve, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, if I could ask David Wood 
to join us. Thank you, Neil. That was incredible. Hi, David. Uh, so this is basically just me having left the army or or moving up to leaving the army and and how it went for me. Uh, my my transition period was was pretty poor. To be honest, I couldn't work out what I wanted to do when I became a civvy. I knew I didn't want to do what I've been doing for the previous twenty four years, which was maritime logistics. So in my resettlement, I did a bit of project management courses, but then realised during that I didn't really want to be a project manager. I did a bit of facilities management then realized during that I didn't want to be a facilities manager but all the time during that people in my family had been in the construction and and had been site managers so it was in the back of my mind that that's what I wanted to do so I kind of wasted my transition period from the military and started doing everything once I'd left so when I started applying for jobs in this sector, I, I left the army in April of 2020, which as you're all aware, was basically the start of the COVID pandemic. So it, it was kind of tough by that. A lot of people weren't employing, certainly somebody with no experience. Uh, a lot of my early applications were just, you know, from the, the wanted ads as it were, and I didn't really get much of a response from them. Uh, and if I did get a response, they were always negative. Because again, COVID, nobody was employing. Once I, I was told about <coughs> Buildforce, uh, I, I applied for it and, and got accepted onto them. And I started attending these seminars and they started sending me job offers. And a lot of them weren't in the, the area I wanted to be in, uh, location-wise. But then this Barclays one came up. It was the it opened the door for me it got me through you know there was nobody there saying no no experience they were prepared to take me on with no experience um between getting this job you know i was i was taking any old job i worked in amazon for a bit i did a couple of delivery jobs i took a bit of time out to do homeschooling for my nipper that was fun but then at about christmas well before christmas september uh, I was back on it again, trying to find jobs. And that's when my process started to get this job. Getting the job with Berkeley's was was a very simple process. Uh, like I say, Build Force sent me the, the information saying that they were had an apprenticeship open. I applied for it. I got accepted. I was invited along to an open day. Went up to Heartland Village, which is in Fleet in Hampshire had a look around there was a uh, managers there from each different department so the ones that were spoken about earlier commercial technical and build as i said before i always knew i wanted to be in build so whilst technical and commercial will sound very nice i only really listened in on the the build part from there had a bit of a an informal discussion with someone from barclays uh, obviously they liked what they saw because they invited me back for a more of a formal interview and following that i was offered a role and that's where i am now up here in stains in eden grove what do i do day to day now so it's kind of split in two what i do so i've got my my general duties as a site manager which can include uh, i take daily logistic coordination meetings I'm sort of contractor liaison. I do safety observations, fire safety checks. I do risk reviews and quality assurance and also contract deconfliction. But then because I've been around following the facade manager, I'm also learning that side of the role as well. So going around learning the technical specifications of what well, simply put metal window frames. Uh, facade boarding fire stopping and all of that good stuff my advice to you really sort of moving forward through the military you know i appreciate everyone keeps relating to the army but i'm sure there's some navy and ref out there have a really good think about what you want to do prior to leaving you know i, I left it really late i was out of the army before i worked out what i wanted to do work out what you want to do your resettlement then sort of plan that toward that future role yeah don't waste it i certainly did before you even leave the military you know don't be afraid to get in touch with companies that are uh, 
in, in the region that you want to work in. Tell them that you'll come along and do some shadowing. It's one of the things that Build Force asked me if I wanted to do. Go on some work sites, start shadowing. Yeah, it's, it's not paid, but it's experience, and everyone's looking for experience. Should you get offered a role that you feel is sort of below your level, don't be afraid to take it. Because whilst you're working up to where you want to be, you're going to get the experience that you need to then carry out that role. And uh, yeah, the main part for me was Build Force was a, a lot of support from my point of joining them. They were always on the phone to me. I was always getting emails. There was a lot of not offers of work, but opportunities of work. Like I say, unfortunately for me, they're outside of my region of, of interest to work in. But fortunately, Barclays showed up. David, that was fantastic. A very, very candid account. So thank you. And we hear that all too often. Transitions aren't picture perfect or blue skies. So um, if I could pass over to, or pass back to rather, um, Sophie Harrison, who's just going to share more about the, the current job opportunities available. Yeah, sure. So um, really, there are two opportunities, two kinds of opportunities. So the first ones, as you've heard, are with our supply chain. So they would be with the subcontractors who you've just heard from. There'd be uh, opportunities in things like plumbing, dry lining or electrical. Those opportunities tend to come up on an ad hoc basis. So if you're interested, the best thing to do usually is email your CV. The email address is employmentskills at barclaygroup.co.uk. Not expecting you to write that down right now. So we will make sure it's circulated at the end. Uh, and just remember that we do have seven live construction sites, so you'll want to be living close to, to one of them. We have sites in London, Staines upon Thames, Fleet in Hampshire and Reading. Then we also have direct apprenticeships. Those are directly with the business, the project team that oversees the subcontractors. We offer apprenticeships on a yearly basis. We haven't quite had our numbers confirmed, but we know we will definitely be taking on apprentices in our commercial and technical teams. And also there will be a small number of construction management opportunities. For direct apprenticeships, you usually need maths and English, minimum grade C or grade five at GCSE. And we just want lots of energy, initiative, commitment and transferable skills. We haven't yet confirmed the application window, so it's a case of just checking our website. If you look for Barclay Group Careers, you'll see them on there. And in the meantime, it's, again, never a bad thing to send us your CV so that we've got it and we keep you in mind if any opportunities do come up. Again, the email address is employmentskills at barclaygroup.co.uk. If your CV gets through the first round, we would invite you to a recruitment day. That's exactly what David was talking about earlier. You would be invited to a site like Heartland Village. You would get a tour of the site. You would meet the project team and learn a little bit more about the role. And then you would have an interview. After the interview, you would have, uh, if you were successful, you would be put through to a second round interview with the project director and you would hear from us thereafter. That really is, is the best way of getting in touch. We do have we do offer things like work trials if you're wondering, is the construction industry, industry for me? And we can certainly uh, help with any questions if you just email that same address. Okay, Sophie, thank you very much. If I could ask all our speakers to switch their cameras on, please. Um, we'll just ask a few quick questions. If you do have a question, please um, raise your hand. You're more than welcome to join us. Um, and ask away. So I'll kick off with a few just to get us going. I think, Pat, a, a quick question for you. You shared some of the technical solutions and design details as part of your presentation. So to give comfort to those that have got limited experience here, how do Berkeley invest in veterans and upskill them? So we take on people of any skill level, to be quite honest. At that stage in their, their career or their development we're more interested in the willingness of them to do it and it's more about the temperament and people wanting to be with us and wanting to do well in the job and if people want to be with us and want to do well we will go to the ends of the earth to train people quite frankly we will do whatever is necessary to upskill people Okay, that's really warming to hear, Pat. Thank you. A question for Brian. So McGinley's at a partner, as you called them, or a, a subcontractor. Can I ask why life is so much more fun and exciting in this space than it is working for a main contractor? Um, because you're working with um, 
array of compliance. So contractors, so yeah, that's the you know, enjoyable part about it. So that's so you're not just with the one big company, like you're, you're working with them all. I just find it very enjoyable with the role that we actually play in it, like, you know, because we did with everyone across the job, like, you know, so it's just, I just enjoy it, you know, and every day is interest and every day is a challenge. Um, some people think that the logistics isn't an, 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 an important a part of the industry, but it's such a crucial, critical a part of each project. I'm sure you can agree with that, like, you know, and I'm, you build up these relationships, and like I say, even if you work with a good DPT, they do the fire the doors for us. So it's like just building those relationships. For this. Okay, and I thank you for that. Um, thank you for that, Brian. And a question for Neve. Um, Neve, you you showcased the career routes and the case studies that you shared and investing in people, training them, developing them. It's all incredible stuff. And for me, that defines an excellent employer. So what are your current projects? What opportunities do you have? Um, so we have on average anything from 11 to 17 live projects. Um, as I said, they're all different. One could be a small doctor's surgery with all new fire doors, and then the other one's like a big, huge project like the Oval. Um, so basically, it's, it's similar to what Patrick said. If you have the will, there's a way. You know, with us, the difference would be, um, would be a more personal involvement. So like our contracts manager would know exactly who you are. He would he would know and I would know your skill set if it's working where we thought you might want to do what where you want to be if it's not working or maybe we think well right, okay well you're good at that so why don't we put you on a smaller job or a bigger job like we've got some of our black hats are more capable of dealing with um, the you know Brian's team they de they deal with big huge on the big scale with the lots and lots of challenges all day every day coming from different angles. Um, we also have those jobs, but we also have the smaller jobs where the workload is kind of a little bit more organized and streamlined. And sometimes people's skill sets are different. Um, again, with trade side, aside from management, we have handymen, I suppose, that started as laborers and now they're doing ironmongery all day, every day. And that's what they like to do. And they're quite happy doing ironmongery. And they say, no, no, I don't want to. I don't want to do the harder, the heavier stuff because I've a bad knee or something like that. And as long as we have space and the individual wants to work, wants to be part of a team long term, that there is room and there always will be room. So fantastic. And a question to both you or, or Brian. Obviously, working within a family business, <laughs> um, it's just a, a kind of very different culture. And um, what do you think is the biggest draw or benefit of that? Well, on my thing, it's it's like being with a business for such a long period of time, so similar to the DPT, you get to know all the people on the jobs. Like, you know, you get Pat alluded to it earlier also. You only understand the job when you get the boots on the ground. So we try to visit all the jobs. We don't be stuck in the office. We get out and speak to people, speak to different subcontractors. factors. Different side to get managers to understand the job, like you know, so it's not like we're not a corporate company, we're very hands on on all our projects. Okay, and again, Neve, you feel the same? Yeah, it's the same. Like De Dennis would know, um, I would say 95% of our workforce by name, you know, and he, he when he'd walk on site, he'd know exactly who they were, and it goes both ways, you know, if there's any problems is always someone who has problems somewhere but um instead of going up a chain of command it's yeah. a text or an email or a phone call like you know and there, it's the door is i feel like it makes the door a little bit more open you know yeah no it does and a question for david david you give a very candid account of your transition and i think you nominalized it which was really really good because some people are leaving the armed forces and they really don't know what to do so and they shouldn't be panicking about that because it is a process you advised um as part of your presentation to take a role that's beneath you uh, and don't be afraid to work up so have you yourself progressed and how quickly was that i wouldn't say i progressed because i'm only four months into an apprenticeship 
But, but you see I, it I've, ahead of you. Uh, certainly, yeah, yeah. My uh, my career path, if I stay within this sector, has been, you know, mapped out for me. I can see my future. You know, the only thing that's holding me back is myself and my ability to do the job. Okay, so definitely um, there. Again, a question has come in from David, which I think Pat has picked up on. Um, I'll just read it out. MVQ Level 3 um, in gas and gas refrigeration and air conditioning. Is there work available for me? Um, and Pat's come back and said yes. Is that... Um, I, sorry, Pat. I can't expand on that. I was yes, going please. to, but just in case you disappeared, I just wanted to get an answer in. So that there are... We obviously install air conditioning systems within a lot of our buildings so we wouldn't directly employ david but one of our subcontractors would employ david and when the buildings are occupied all the air conditioning systems need regular servicing so our estates department they employ specific companies to undertake those works through the managing agent so there is a lot of need for david's nvq level three skill set in the industry Okay, no, thank you for that. And a question for, for all of you, we'll start with you, Pat. In terms of what do you see are the most credible and beneficial traits of the ex-military? It is, well, as we've all said, everybody on here said, it is about people. Our business is about people. We just have people who happen to build buildings. But the industry is all about people and it is all about relationships and being organised and People from the military, I found, are very well organised. They generally get on well with people and they can build relationships. So as, as long as you have that, and like we've all said, you have that can-do mindset, you'll go far in this industry. Okay, and Brian? I just say echo what get past there. There are also um, ex-military people seem to have an ethic about them. You know, they've been it's been drilled into them. It was by a choice that they had been in the army, so they wanted to go into the army, so they've got that good detail about them. Also, a lot of the jobs we do, especially the size of the past jobs, you need an eye for good detail and cleanliness and your tidiness on a job where you can see, because that's the same always that goes, a tidy site is a safe site, which is key to what we do. And especially with the Berkeley food group, they have a minimum standard across all their projects where cleanliness is the key to a successful delivery of a job and that can be anything from the presentation of the job on the outside of it to the access to the pedestrian access where you go up through the building also where there's a lot of trades together so they're all sort of collaborating and cooperating together which is the key thing which i think that they pick up in the army it's a key skill so it's, okay. it's, it's in their DNA, you could say. It, well, Joe, couldn't agree more. Couldn't I agree more, yeah. Brian? No, listen, we are short for time. So thank you to Sophie, Pat, Brian, Neve, and David for their incredible contribution today. The draw to construction includes the ability to problem solve, have a logistical mindset and work with people and getting those boots on and getting out on site. For, so for those that have no desire for a desk job, but want to exercise those leadership and management skills, a career with Berkeley or the supply chain, MCG and DPT offer incredible opportunities. Now, this is a tried and tested pathway for many of your peers and colleagues before you, and it is an incredible second career with many rewards, challenges and thrills. You are not alone. I know Caroline's been messaging in the background. We are here to support you and guide you through your transition. So please get in touch if you have any questions. And a huge thank you to Berkeley's for joining us today. I really, really enjoyed it. I'll pass back to Caroline. Thanks, Angela. And, and just to echo um, your thanks, some really um, great, valuable, detailed um, information there and really lovely to see David flourishing. So thanks for joining us, David. Um, so just a couple of things. Uh, we have our next virtual career, hat, career chat next week um, with, uh, with Amy and they are discussing facilities management. So if you're looking 
or thinking about a career in facilities management, building, surveying, etc. Maintenance, then um, please do book your place. And of course, on March the 3rd is our big event. It's our face to face Armed Forces Insight Day with 40 employers. Barclays are going to be there as well. And um, that's at the Cotton Centre in London. Do not miss out. Um, email me to serve, save your place. So sorry, I'm really rushing because I know we've overran loads of information. So thank you all. And thank you all for listening. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye.